Well, hello, I'm Tom Murray, the Director of Innovation for Future Ready Schools, a project of All for Ed located in Washington, D.C. Future Ready Schools is a collaboration between All for Ed and a vast coalition of over 60 national and regional partner organizations. The goal of Future Ready Schools is to maximize learning opportunities for all students and to help school districts move quickly towards student-centered learning. The effort provides educators with resources and support to ensure that local strategic and technology plans align with instructional best practices are implemented by highly trained teachers, which you'll see some of them today, and maximize personal and authentic learning experiences for all students, particularly those from historically underserved communities. As always, the hashtag for today's webinar is Future Ready. Thanks for making an investment in your time for joining us today. I'm going to be your host on this webinar on everyday social emotional learning practices that make a difference. And joining us for today's event, I could not be more excited. We have uh, Jennifer, a fifth grade teacher, Brittany, another fifth grade teacher, Mary, who you heard from in the fall, a principal, and Lori, a kindergarten teacher. And I kept that real short so you each could do some introductions. So Jennifer, tell us a little bit about um, what you teach, anything about your background, and then we'll go over to Brittany. Okay. My name is Jennifer Bean. I am a fifth grade math and science teacher. This is my 11th year all spent at Robert E. Lee Elementary in Tullahoma. Awesome. How about you, Brittany? Hi, I'm Brittany Cleveland. I am the fifth grade ELA teacher. This is my 15th year teaching. I've taught fourth and fifth grade, and before that, I've taught PE. Wonderful. We're getting the whole scope of it today. Let's jump down to kindergarten. Lori, over to you. Um, my name is Lori, and I have been teaching for 22 years, and 20 of those have been in kindergarten. Well, I said when we were hopping on this, I think there's a special place in heaven for kindergarten teachers. That is <laughs> yes. for sure. Thank you for your work. And if you watched our last webinar that we did in the fall with Mary, you got to know her a little bit, but the one and only Mary Gilbert. Mary, just quick introductions for maybe those that haven't seen our previous webinar. Absolutely. Well, I'm honored to be here today and I get to share the rock stars that we have at our school. So I can't wait for you all to hear from them. But this is, I believe it's my 40th year. Uh, as an educator. And so I'm excited to be here today. So thank you for that opportunity. Absolutely. And your passion, Mary, radiates. And I'm so excited to connect with your teachers today. In the last webinar, you kept shining the light on their incredible things that they were doing each and every day. And I'll give kudos to your leadership there as well. So Mary, I want to start with you. Let's build on our previous webinar. For those that haven't seen it, um, we talked a lot about social emotional learning and we're going to dive back in and now kind of the classroom level today. But since the fall, we've gone through the winter. We're a number of months later. You know, that end of school year is starting to be on the horizon. We're kind of in April now. So Mary, tell us a little bit about, if you would, what you've seen throughout the year, what you've observed, additional needs and those kinds of things. Update us a little bit since last time. Yes. Um, I believe that we see a lot of needs with our students, but I also think the impact of post-COVID and the pandemic that we have larger gaps, we have more serious trauma with a lot of students trying to help them learn how to de-escalate, how to communicate, how to self-regulate, and just those opportunities to be able to engage in conversation and activities with other students, that has really had a tremendous impact in the schools. That we have to work with that before we can teach our students and really focus on the academics. So we've really, you know, gone back to putting our students first, which we always have. We look at building those intentional relationships, really loving our students, getting to know them. Then we're presenting that high quality educational uh, instruction, you know, to really uh, close those gaps and really see that growth in their academics. So it's really looking at the whole child. And that's what I think they're going to share with you today, some of those things that we have tried to implement because we see it's huge. It's huge. There's always been needs, but we're seeing needs that have intensified at a level we have not experienced previously. So I'd love for them to share with you about, you know, those things that we've experienced and what we've tried to do to help in those situations. 
Yeah, absolutely. And you know, we're hearing that across the country and you mentioned the word gaps. And so Lori, let's start with you at the kindergarten level and talk to us about maybe some of the additional types of gaps you're seeing, how you're addressing them, um, how you're handling them. Again, an issue that we're hearing all over the place coming really out of COVID. So talk to us about some of the gaps you're seeing in kindergarten and what you're doing to help address them. Um, well, I think everybody has seen a change in standards with each grade level over you know, the past several years. And so when COVID hit, you know, a lot of students didn't attend any kind of daycare or preschool before coming to us. So that year when we got back in school, we really saw a lot of gaps where students had not been anywhere for a year or so. Um, and, And then even now that kids have been going back to preschool, we're still seeing those gaps Um, for whatever reason. Um, There's a lot of students that come to us where they have a hard time expressing themselves. So that language is not there for them. And, you know, in kindergarten, you know, that's a lot of what we do is, is talking and expressing ourselves. And so we came up with an idea to, you know, try to help figure out how we could help meet those needs. You know, we can try to build relationships with students as much as we want, but when there's one teacher and a lot of students, that can be hard sometimes. Um, So um, we started talking about trying to do some buddy up and trying to help, you know, kind of um, close some of those gaps. Um, It's not the fix of all things, but it definitely, you know, helps. I'm sure they're seeing a difference too with, you know, just the stand, the standards, you know, just changing rapidly. And then where students don't get as much, I think sometimes at home or, you know, for whatever reason, you know, the trauma and um, I'm I'm not sure the word I'm really looking for right now, but, you know, it's just, it's very different now. I feel like, you know, from even from five years ago, you know, especially 10 years ago, um, where students have really struggled with that. Yeah. Yeah. And we're hearing a lot of that. And, and I want to jump up to, to the other end of the elementary spectrum there to Jennifer and Brittany. Reflect on the same question, if you could. As fifth grade teachers, talk to us about maybe some of the gaps or differences you've seen, but then also we recognize and knowing specifically about your building, the student success across the various levels and things you've put in place to help make that success happen. And I know even partnering up with kindergarten and fifth grade and referencing Lori, the buddies there is is one piece to that. But Jennifer and Brittany, reflect a little bit if you could, any of those same types of gaps that you're seeing and then what you've done from the student success end across the levels, things that you've put in place there. Yeah, sure. So I think we echo the same sentiments that Lori just mentioned. Even though she's talking about kindergarten, we see those exact same things in fifth grade where we see academic gaps that continue to grow, unfortunately. But at the same time, you know, we are responsible for that on grade level content too. So building those building blocks, especially with math and that um, prerequisite knowledge, but then continuing to help them grow has been a challenge. And I think, especially in my classroom, some of my students in math, they have never experienced success with math. And so when they come into my room, they don't have confidence when they walk in and they automatically think, I I can't do this. It's too hard. And so with Kinder Buddies, it gives all of our kids the um, accessibility to experience success. It doesn't matter whatever level they're on. They can walk into a kindergarten classroom. They can talk with their Kinder Buddy. Hey, what did you do last night? What did you eat for supper? And it's automatic. They get the biggest smile on their face. They get the biggest hugs from their kinder buddy. And then all of a sudden their day has turned around. And we've seen a huge difference. We started this last year with kinder buddies. And I just honestly can't imagine not doing it at this point with the success that we have seen. Yeah, I love that idea of the kinder buddies and and the connections that you're seeing there. And it is interesting because, you know, going to the one of the gaps that we hear all over the country as well is around things like student behavior, right? I mean, let's face it, for a good period of time, students weren't out at recess and interacting and doing all that stuff. And so certainly some gaps there. 
but it's fascinating how something like partnering up as kinder buddies and doing that very intentionally, you can watch that fifth grader at times all of a sudden change a bit and recognizing I'm a mentor right now. I need to do this really, really well and can see that there as well. Other, other thoughts from fifth grade? Adding to that, our students who have had behavior problems, um, if they've had behavior problems through the week or if they have not completed their work for the week, they will stay with one of us will stay behind in a classroom and they will stay with one of us and complete their work or reflect on why you know they had behavior problems that week and they are not able to go to kinder buddies and it crushes okay. them. They hate it. Even if they accidentally forgot their homework, I mean, it just crushes them. Um, she had a student last Friday who is, he has to stay back with us quite a bit. Um, <laughs> but he came to her on the day that he was able to go back and he actually went up to her and he said, I'm sorry, I haven't been here. Um, so, and for him to even apologize like that was huge for us. And I was so proud of him yeah. and I praised him for that because it was a big step for him. He did not like to miss no. kinder buddies. And his response was, I'm sorry, I haven't been here for my buddy and I'll try to do better. Yeah. So he Cause he felt the innate happy. sense of letting his, yeah, letting his kindergarten buddy down. Right. You know, and when we think about these kinds of examples here, it's always that balance from the SEL side of recognizing Chances are that's a student that has some significant SEL needs. I mean, I could be wrong there, but just making that guess and the balance of the high expectations and the consequences that need to be in place and the rewards and, you know, great teachers like you all keep that accountability in place, yet continue to give them things to strive for and push them and reward them as needed as well. And so, you know, certainly another great example. And Mary, I want to go back over to you, um, you know, getting to hear from your teachers. And I'm just watching your smile, by the way, listening to them talk. And I know on our previous webinar, you've talked about all of your staff, right? And the incredible staff that you have there. I'm going to ask for you thinking, you know, a principal colleague uh, somewhere in the country comes to you and says, you know, hey, I've been observing your teachers, listening to your teachers. And, you know, you, we've got a whole bunch of different SEL type practices. There's everyday practices in place. Maybe where do I start? Like what, what um, talk to your principal colleagues in terms of how do we make sure that we're intentional about this? You know, I would say every, every district, every building's doing something somewhere, but as intentional as you are on a daily basis, weekly basis about some of these things with your teachers, what advice do you have for your principal colleagues to start to put some of these things in place or at least be really intentional about making sure it's a regular occurrence and not just a little add on? You know, I, I think that's a great question. And I think the first thing that I hear you say that that we would believe in is being intentional and everybody's at a different place. And so when, you know, I, we started this four years ago, it was really listening to the teachers, taking that time. What are you seeing? What are our needs? And so we rolled it out with our staff and then we did some fun things. I think the first thing we did was the, the making up the hand job. Yes. And we did that. And the next thing I knew, I'm walking around the building. I didn't say you had to do it. It was showing modeling like they were saying. And then all of a sudden the students loved it. Teachers loved it. And they're the rock stars that have taken it and built it and owned it. And then every grade level looks a little different. But that's okay because they're making it their own and it's based on their needs. So I think as an administrator, take time to listen to your teachers. Let them help drive it. Be intentional with it. You know, one of the things that they recognized at the beginning of the year, for example, um, kindergarten came in and their fine motor skills were not where y'all had seen them. And so they were great to share that with me. And so we had some kits. We you know, wrote a grant to get some more. But, you know, like Lori said, there's one teacher and there's all these students. So what is a win-win to have that there? Fifth grade, bring those fifth graders there. Then all of a sudden you have lots of mini teachers and they're showing, they're doing, they're feeling successful. So I think that's the buy-in is that as an administrator, you're not just out there over here saying, oh, we need this. No, it's a collaborative team effort. We need this. And then I think as you go along, y'all saw some things, ooh, this is working, ooh, no, this is not working. Maybe as you tweak the activities and y'all came up with different things. We've done a couple activities that we went through. Yeah, and they, and, <laughs> but they're honest with me and they'll say that that did not work, you know, or, you know, I love their thinking though, because I don't tell them to reflect, they reflect. 
And they're looking at, okay, we can do this better by doing X, Y, yeah. and Z. And so I think that's why I get so excited as an administrator, because I'm just stepping back going, wow, they're making this happen because I think it goes back to students first. What do our students need? And, you know, I was thinking about the week that they had, you know, you might go down there one Friday and it might be all these games, but some of those fifth graders, they need to know how to take turns and how mm -hmm. to not always win. Mm -hmm. And if they, because you put them in competitive sports, that's when you have some issues, but now they're being the model to teach. And so they're building and they're making things. So I've seen a change in office referrals because they're learning. You can read a book and you can talk, 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 but when you put them in that setting and they're practicing that serve and return, the rules, the expectations, they're being the models. That is just powerful to see the long-term effects. So I think as an administrator, I would start with, with the teachers. Where are we? And really be honest, be transparent with, you know what, this is working, but this is not working. And we've had those conversations. Um, but then celebrate. When you have those great moments, go back in staff meetings, go back and do your shout outs. Because I'll be honest with you, they wouldn't share that unless I go to them and say, hey, I need you to come share your story because <laughs> they're not those type of teachers. Lori, if you give her a microphone, <laughs> she'll be like, no way. Right? <laughs> but if I come to her and say, hey, I need you, would you share this story? She's more than willing to do it. You are too, mm -hmm. but y'all are not the type to just walk. Oh, let me, right. Yeah. So I think sharing out these wonderful stories so that others, and I think that's what's made it grow in the other grade levels is they've heard the stories and now they're kind of like, Ooh, we want to try that. We want to see that. And you know, I want to, I didn't ask permission for this, but I'm going to share it. Um, so many times people say academics, those gaps, we don't have time. We just don't have time, Mary. That's fluff. But when they see these teachers and they see that they're taking time to love our students first, build relationships, and then the academics and their academics show in their data that it works, you can't really argue with that. So, you know, the academics will come when you take the time to really focus on those SEL needs. And so that's something they're not just rock stars with loving their students but they're taking them to a higher level with the academics as well, closing those gaps. So I think that's the win-win. And when you have a student that feels and believes in themselves, I mean, that's powerful. They may not remember in 20 years what lesson they had, but they're going to remember Kinder Buddies and they're going to remember Friendship Fridays. We have students that the parents will say, we can't miss on Fridays. We had to change a doctor's appointment to be there. So think about your attendance. They mm -hmm. will not miss. Mm -hmm. And so those are the things that I think are just powerful. And so that's what I would say as an administrator. Yeah, I love that. And I have to be honest, you know, when you're, uh, you reference the, um, the, the child in elementary, upper elementary, that's a little bit competitive. Um, I actually was wondering if you started talking about the child that I happen to have in my household, um, <laughs> that I happen to also call my son. And I, but I'll tell you, listen, and, and a great, great kid, but uber competitive and in those unstructured times can struggle a little bit. And what I'll tell you, and by the way, it's uber humbling, humbling as a former elementary principal to get the call from the elementary principal that, that you work with. Completely high, right? um, but what I'll share is from a strategy, one of the things that they do, and it's not just specific to my child by any means, um, they call it guest teacher is one of the rewards that kids can work towards and kids get different stamps for great behavior and working hard and just uh, really trying in certain things. And and so my son who loves phys ed and yes, he's old, uber competitive and 90% of his issues will be out on recess. He gets to occasionally, a couple times already this year, be the quote unquote guest teacher teacher for a phys ed class. And it's typically a kindergarten class where he becomes the helper. So he goes in as a teacher's helper and it's part of a reward. And so they pick a day that's going to work. And so a couple of days he's at double gym, which has been the most fabulous days in his world, of course. But point being, it's giving just like you're doing children something to work towards, building that relationship, the relationship then with that additional teacher, and then giving them something they 
kind of feel in charge of. He comes home on those days so amazingly proud. And so whether you're talking Kinder Buddies, some of the other programs that, that are just absolutely amazing. Mary, I want you to give a shout out to, I remember in the fall you talked about um, the Harmony program that you also use. Give a, For anybody that didn't see that, talk to us in just a couple minutes if you could about um, the way you access that, what that is, how, how students can access that, how it benefits this whole conversation. Because, you know, teachers is, they have so much on their plate. There's so, so many things going on. And quite often it's like, where do I start? What's a great resource? And Harmony that you talked about certainly is one of the best out there. So just give us a quick, quick commercial if you could. Talk to us a little bit about that, uh, how places can access that and what that's all about. Absolutely. So that's really where we started four years ago. Um, and I'll have the teacher share a little bit about that because when I went to uh, ask them kind of where they were when we were talking about it, the HarmonySEL.org is free. So you can use and access any of the materials, the curriculums there, the meetup. If they, if a teacher wants to know more about meetup, it's all there, how to lay it out. If they want to know more about buddy up, it's all there. There's the cards that they can utilize. I know that many times y'all mm -hmm. use those in your morning meetings yes. and I'll have them. I really feel like they need to share that because that that's just powerful to hear how easy they're not having to go find something. So you can download it. The songs are there. The curriculum's there. The stories are there. They have new editions with shorter stories. The game app is huge. And so everything's on that game app. It has the relaxation stations. You can use any of this. So I know a lot of times when you start, if you just start with meet up and buddy up, and then it shows you what does it look like to be a good buddy? What does it sound like? What does it feel like? But for teachers, they don't have time. I mean, think about it. They're doing 500 things. So to know they can go to one resource and there's the cards for that topic. So I'll let them kind of share some cards. Lori, tell us about that at the primary level. How, how does that get used or maybe in first into second grade that, that you know of? What's that look like on your end? Um, well, first of all, I want to I want to say it's not a lot of time. Like I know teachers hear things and they're like, they immediately like sink because they're like, how do I fit something else right. in? Um, you can make it as long or as short as you want, mm -hmm. um, you know, depending on your time of the day. Um, but I do think it's really important because it does build relationships with the students and the students between the teacher. Um, but like in kindergarten, my kids do a greeting every day. We have a, a different greeting and we use the same greeting every week. So they know the greeting by the end of the week. Um, and then we have like a share out, um, and then they'll buddy up with something. And again, like she said, it's all there. So mm -hmm. you're not having to create anything. Now there are times I, I do tweak things cause I may not find it, you know, super appropriate for my class or I'm like, mm, I don't think my class is ready for that. Or, you know, so you can easily tweak things, but it's, I'm not having yeah. to create things. Mm -hmm. Um, it's all there. Um, and I'm pretty sure I just heard lots of amens across the board from <laughs> yeah, teachers that were just watching that, yeah. right? Right. Good stuff there. Um, and Jennifer, Britton, what about second, like, what about the upper elementary? What's it look like for you all using Harmony? Yeah, so we have been doing a morning meeting for four years, I believe. Mm -hmm. So every single morning at eight o'clock as a grade level, we all come together, which has been really beneficial for us just being able to come as a whole grade level. We talked the very first day about how we are a family in fifth grade. This is your fifth grade family. You are going to buddy up with people you may have never spoken to in the time that you have been at Robert E. Lee, but you are going to get to know your peers and your classmates. And so each day it is a different buddy up card um, and they can be super silly one day, but then it can turn around the next day and be a quote that they have to think about and apply um, to something that's happened to them. So it really just um, varies. And like Lori said, you're not having to find anything. You're not having to make anything. It is right there for you to adjust as you need to adjust it for your class or your grade level. And I'll say to kindergarten does not do it all together. We do it in right. our own mm -hmm. classes. I just, we feel like with our group, it would be too much. Mm -hmm. I just want to preface that, you know, preface yes. that, 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 you know, that's how they do it a little differently. Yes. I think that's up to any grade level. Absolutely. And that right. Well, and having the flexibility to do that is important, right? Having a leader that recognizes the need to say, hey, we need to do it this way and we're going to do it this way and recognizes, hey, if that's what's best for your kids also speaks to the leadership. So you know, all good stuff around there. Well, and they make a point like fifth grade, there's a T hall. And so they make sure that they do it out in the T hall. You go in the fourth grade, there's a pod. They do it out in the pod. 
you go in the third grade and they'll be in the cafeteria. This is all the things that the teachers have come up with, but you go to a second grade, first grade, or kindergarten, you'll see it individually in the classroom where the teacher's doing it with the students. And that's what I love is that they make it their own on, you know, for what fits their own unique needs. And I know sometimes I know one time I was down there when y'all were doing the cards and you know, you pick the card that's most appropriate. Like mm -hmm. Lori was saying, you may have a card and that may not be the one for that day that you really feel like is the one you need to, you know, capture. But something that I thought was neat that they did too, they took a lot of the harmony themes and used that vocabulary and they have harmony superlatives. And that's really cool. And so you might tell them a little bit yeah. about the harmony superlatives. We introduced all of the superlatives at the beginning of the year. They're all hanging in the hallway. Um, and so we tell the kids throughout the year, if you see students modeling these um, traits, keep that in mind because well, probably this month, yeah. <laughs> we will start nominating students for those um, superlatives. And so it's neat because the kids get to actually nominate who they think deserves those superlatives. Um, last year when we did this, they chose, I mean, every superlative fit those students perfectly. And it was neat to see that the students had recognized what we've always yes. recognized. So that's something they can look forward to and work toward. And let's say we're having a problem with being empathetic. We'll mention that superlative and say, now let's make sure we're modeling how to be a good empathetic friend and tell them, you know, some, some ways that you could model that. And it just kind of, you know, helps them get back on task with being good people. Yes. And it's just something neat to look forward to. And they get their picture in the yearbook at the end of the year. And we announce them at graduation. So it's just neat for them. Yeah, yeah great stuff. And yet another strategy, right? Like another strategy you all have in place that gets to the heart of what we're talking about. Mary, go ahead. There was another strategy strategy I was thinking about. With the Harmony um, New Edition, they have the personal goals. And, you know, being a former counselor, I'm all over, you know, trying to figure out how can students set their own goals and work on that, but reflect. And so that's in there. But they have taken that and we've used it specifically with several students. And it's neat to see when you track it, how they start owning it. They're looking at it. So that's another thing that some schools might want to think about looking at because it's right there for them. Uh, this week I had an office referral for a student and honestly that what we saw was the child really could not self-regulate that's what it was and we came up with some goals and then we came up with you know today or this morning i met with a student and we were looking at self-reflecting on how do you think you're doing with this you know what do we need to work on but it's really putting that conversation back and we have some check-in people with that student and I think that, that that's why we're not seeing some of those same repeats that we might have seen because we are having them look at those personal goals, self-reflecting, owning it, and trying to figure it out. Um, we started that with a student. This is just a story that I'm thinking about. There was a teacher last year. She's done personal goals forever, but she just kind of forgotten about it, and she brought a student to me. And I said, do you think this is one that we need to go back and do like that with? And she said, uh, you know, honestly, yes. She did, she used it with five students in her room that honestly she was really frustrated with. She came back and she said, Mary, that turned it around. She said, it's like it clicked. Wait a minute, I'm responsible for this. This is what I'm doing. And it really made a difference in her classroom. Now, you know, I'm not saying that every time that's gonna be a perfect fit, but it sure is something that's a life skill for us to teach children. And that's how to set goals, how to own them, how to self-reflect and be responsible for, you know, regulating yourself. Yeah, that's a great reflection point there. Oh, th yeah, that's a great reflection point there, I think, because when we, you know, we often are setting goals. Uh, lots of teachers will have kids set goals, right? I want to read this number of books. I want to master my multiplication facts. But when you look at it, on the other side of things, as a human being, you know, my own way I'm regulating myself and those types of things. A lot of times we miss that. And so that can truly go hand in hand and absolutely love that. I want to get into a few more um, practices here in just a moment, but I do want to remind everybody that today's hashtag, uh, as always, is future ready. So Lori, I'm going to come back to you for a moment. You know, we titled this webinar, Everyday Social Emotional Learning Practices That Make a Difference. You all have thrown a whole bunch our way already, but I want to give you 
thinking about primary, um, maybe it's not harmony related this time. Maybe it's not about the buddies. Just what is every, what is some everyday practices look like that really prioritize SEL? Going back to your point, this isn't just, we got to spend all this additional time doing all this stuff. No teacher in the world feels they have that. What are some everyday practices look like at primary around SEL? Um, well, I, like I said earlier, really just starting the day off with morning meeting just gets their day going in the right direction, I feel like. Um, and um, the kids just, they sit in tables in our, in our classrooms in kindergarten, um, but teaching the kids, kind of trying to help them, like they said earlier, you know, we talk about family, we're together for a full year. So we try to really, you know, work hard of being kind and working on relationships um, and helping one another. Um, and we have um, created um, Lion Pride here, yes. um, which I don't even know what you would call that. Um, part of our behavior. It is. We did um, a code of conduct and then our behavior plan with that. Yes. Yeah. But it's kind of a positive. It's a, yes. Positive and it's, yeah. So we kind of go over rules and expectations every day mm -hmm. and what they mean and what they look like. Sometimes we act them out, um, you know, and I think that's just really important for the, these kids because where we used to kind of have the um, assumption that kids were getting taught this at home or elsewhere or even in preschool and stuff, you know, a lot of kids are not getting this. Um, and so they don't know how to, um, you know, like she was saying, self-regulate or, you um, you know, if they get upset, you know, learning how to kind of um, come back from that. Um, you know, we have calm corners or peace corners in our classrooms. And we talk about that and why you might go there and what you can do while you're there. Um, so if the classroom just looks very different now than it did, you know, 10 years ago or even five years ago, um, you know, trying to help students understand their emotions. Yeah, well said, Lori. Thanks for giving some additional strategies for our listeners. Great ideas, great input. So let's jump back up, Jennifer and Brittany, back up to the other end of elementary there. What what do you see as just everyday type strategies um, for third, fourth, fifth grade, just the upper end that, that you seem that work? So I think for fifth grade, one of our biggest um, focuses is trying to get them prepared for middle school, right? We want them to be able to transition smoothly. And I think that that's a big reason why we talk so much about them being a family. We want them to feel like they belong. We want them to feel like, you know, they're a part of something bigger, that they have this family to depend on. So like she said, morning meeting, we don't um, ever skip morning meeting. That's a non-negotiable for us. And I know that there are plenty of teachers that are going to say, I don't have two minutes to do a morning meeting. Like, I don't know how to fit this in. Our morning meetings take about 10 minutes, but we end up getting back that time because that's time we get to go over, you know, reminders that we see during the day that, hey, we just want to remind you guys, this is what's happening that's not meeting expectations. And it covers it all at once where we're now getting teaching time back. Um, just by taking those few short minutes in the morning, we're earning that time back through um, teaching our content. And to add to that, I think one thing we sort of we started this in fourth grade and we used when we, we used to share the pod together and our rooms were side by side. So anytime a situation would happen between, you know, a couple of students or if it was just an individual student, we always try to take time and we still do mm -hmm. not to just throw a consequence on them, but to pull them aside and talk to them about that consequence. Why did you do this? What can we do moving forward? And even though, you know, in the past it was always, we don't have time for that with academics first, but just taking that time and talking to them and talking them through it, helping them cope, helping them deescalate, it has, not only has it helped our, rela our relationships with them, but it's just helping them to cope with things better. And then, We've noticed we don't have to meet with those kids as often. I mean, even if it takes 10 minutes out of our, our academic class time, we've learned to be flexible and know that it's okay. 
You're and you know what? That's okay, okay too, because you're all out of school. Right? We get it. Every educator watching was like, I know that feeling. And that is totally fine. Totally fine. That's how we roll. So listen, I do want to uh, wrap up in just a few moments here. I want to give you each one more opportunity, a piece of advice. Let's say somebody's watching this and they're saying, you know, we really relate to some of these gaps they're talking about. Really relate. We're struggling so much with behavior in our school. Really relate. And it's all SEL related, right? It's all that the humanistic side of it. So I'd love for you to give just one piece of advice that that's on your heart, that's on your mind, something you're thinking, another strategy you didn't get to share, or just a starting point. Just one piece of advice to other educators around the country um, about the work, about what we've been talking about um, in any way. So Lord, I'm going to put you on the spot first. So give us a piece of advice to an educator around the country, um, something that's on your heart right now that you're thinking. Um, Honestly, I feel like the Buddy Up has been probably one of the biggest successes we've done um, that I would highly encourage other schools to try it out. Um, It's honestly not hard to start and it's nothing that is difficult to even plan. I know, again, teachers are like, I don't have time to plan something. Um, We spend the first couple of weeks kind of getting to know our students, and then we give our list to the fifth grade teachers, and then they start butting up the students. And if there's like concerns that we have, we've let them know so they kind of know who they might need to buddy up specific students with. And a lot of times it's games and centers that the kids are doing with them so it's again not planning but as a as one teacher i don't always have time to teach all these games to my students so that's actually taking something off of me and letting the fifth graders become teachers and teaching the kids how to play different games it could be games like you know uno sorry a math game um, or even a simple like STEM kind of center of Marvel Run or anything, and the kids just talk. Like there's times that we've told them specific kind of conversation starters to have with the students, especially at the beginning of the year, things they can talk about. But we want it to be this um, stress-free, very um, encouraging open-ended, you know, relationship that they are building for a full year. Um, Or if there's, you know, a skill like or an activity that we're going to work on that week in kindergarten that we feel like the students may need some support with, the fifth graders help them through that. Or it can even be an art activity. I mean, it can be anything. And again, it's not any extra work on us. It's not any extra work on them. And it's something, like she said, the kids look forward to that every single week. And we've even had conversations like if we're having students that are struggling with their language, you know, of just answering questions. I mean, that's another game that we have out there is this headbands game where the kids are learning to ask good questions. Mm -hmm. Um, You know, we the biggest thing is we just want them to have a relationship and talking. That's like the first Thing that, that, you know, that we feel like is the most important out of that. And then other things come with it. Like when we were meeting a few weeks ago about it and she was asking like what all we felt like the kids were getting from it. Like you can list probably 50 things that the kids are getting from it. Um, you know, not just the social and emotional side of it, but there's academics to it too. Um, so honestly, I feel like that is probably my favorite thing that we have mm-hmm. done and we see a lot of success and reward from it. Great, thank you so much for sharing that. Jennifer, let's go over to you. Something, piece of advice you have for your educator colleagues around the country, something that's on your heart, something you wanna share. Yeah, so just like Lori said, you know, we spend the first couple of weeks just getting to know our kids, and that's the same in fifth grade. We don't start any kind of content the first couple of weeks. Those couple of weeks are dedicated to our team, our fifth grade team consists of three teachers, we get to know every single student. So this year it's 80 students and we're gonna make sure that we know them so that we can then help them once we get to that content. Um, And I think it's, you know, loving those babies and sometimes the ones you have to love the most are the hardest to love. But I think getting to know them first and setting intentional relationships. And even if it's not, you that is their go-to person understanding that and that you know it's not the best fit for them 
but finding someone in the building that is the best fit for them. And letting them be check in person, you know, check in people for that kid can change that student's year. Just making That's sure cool. that they have an intentional relationship in our building. Love it, Brittany. How about you? Kind of the same thing. I would just say be patient with your students. We don't know what's going on at home. We don't know what kind of problems they're having. Use that. Be flexible with your time. Use that time to build those relationships. Use that time to have your morning meetings. Build the relationships between the students, letting them feel like we have a community. Just taking that time out of your day to work through if they've got problems, help them work through it. Um, just building those relationships. The academics will come. You just have to build that foundation first. Absolutely. Mary, I'm seeing you beaming with pride again at your three teachers and knowing that they're representatives to, to many others in your building, I'm sure. Mary, talk to us one piece of advice for any educator out there, uh, something that's your, on your heart as well. Yeah, I think what resonates with me is you use the word intentional and I've heard these you know, rock stars use that word intentional too. So I think for me as, as an administrator, it's intentional listening, intentional collaborative planning, intentional meetup intentional buddy up. One of the things that we didn't talk about today, but it was impactful for us, was the say this, not that. Think about your words. And we really spent some time on that too. Uh, kind of a thought to share was I had someone interning with me and they were actually in the room as I was working with a student that had had an office referral. And when they left, something that she said to me resonated. She said, you know, the whole time, she said, my mind was going toward consequences, consequences. She said, when I listened to you go through that process, she said, I thought, oh, my gosh, this is more effective than anything that I've seen. But it was knowing the student, that relationship, getting them to self-reflect, to own that behavior. And that child's not been back. And so I think, yes, we do have to have consequences, but I don't think our mind has to stay there. If we'll take that intentional time, build those relationships, get to know, follow through, then I think that we're going to be more effective in closing those gaps. And like you said, we get that time back. And something a teacher said to us that was really opposed to this at first and said, Mary, this is why I don't have time for this. She said, how can you not take time for this? And I just, that y'all know who I'm talking about. That has just stayed with me. So I think for, as an educator, it's for us to be intentional and the gains and payoff will be powerful. So you've gotten to see the rock stars and there's more here. I just, you know, when you're in our area, we'd love for you to come see us. Absolutely. Wow. So I will, the ultimate compliment I can give as a dad first, not, not future ready first as a dad first, I would put my babies in your classrooms and in your school in a heartbeat. And that is truly the best compliment that I can give. Thank you so much to each of you for, for sharing with us today, for giving some really just practical ideas, some just real life struggles uh, that everybody could really relate to. <clears throat> we also want to give a huge shout out to our partners at Harmony and, and Inspire programs at National University for their support and for supporting today's webinar. I do want to remind our viewers that information about Future Ready Schools can be found at futureready.org. We continue to challenge school and district superintendents to join the over 3,500 others that have signed on to the Future Ready Pledge. I want to also encourage our viewers to get involved with one of our growing strands from district leaders to technology leaders, principals, librarians, instructional coaches. We have vastly expanded the reach of Future Ready in recent years. Check out our private face group book groups as well and on, for ongoing activities to stay connected with those working alongside you throughout the nation as well. Again, I want to thank our team today, as well as thank each of you, our viewers, for joining us for this webinar. Don't forget to connect with us here at Future Ready on Twitter at Future Ready and on Facebook at facebook.com slash Future Ready Schools. If you missed any of today's conversation, it will be archived at futureready.org slash webinars. Thanks again for joining us here at Future Ready Schools. Have a fabulous day. We'll see you next time.